I want to welcome you to Faith Promise, whether you're live at one of the churches, if you're online, if you're a guy behind bars, if you're watching later, we are thrilled about everything that God is doing in and through you. I pray that you are enjoying this series as much as I am uh, called Revival Town. And, and listen, if you're new or maybe you haven't been in a, in a while, I wanna encourage you to go check out the last two messages. And we've been looking at signs of revival in the church. So the message of the last two weeks were huge for that. I believe our time together last week, learning about prayer, I really do believe it did something impactful to our church. Remember Ephesians 6 says that our battle is not against flesh and blood, but against rulers and principalities in heavenly places. So taking that time to focus on that, I believe is gonna lead to a supernatural breakthrough. And so I'm so excited about what God has done and will continue to do. Because what we care most about is what happens in eternity. What we care most about is looking forward to heaven. And maybe you're new to church or to the thought about God, and we're going to talk more about that. But I'm just so excited about what God is doing in and through you. Now, speaking of heaven and eternity, our sign for this week highlights heaven in really the most special way uh, heaven can be highlighted here on earth. Now, remember in this series called Revival Town, we are looking at signs of revival in our hearts and in our church. That's what we're looking for, signs of revival in both of those places. And we're finding and following these signs of revival from God's inspired word in the Bible. But not just that, we're taking a very special time to look at church history and to see how God has moved throughout the church in ways that can only be described as revival. Because we believe that the road to revival is easy to find if we will follow the signs and wonders along the way. Now, just to build our anticipation, to get us involved, and you can see we've tweaked that sentence just a little bit, but can we read this together? The road to revival is easy to find if we will follow the signs and wonders along the way. There is an obedience that is needed by us. And just, I just wanna jump right in. The sign of revival that we are gonna look at this week is people being saved. People being saved. And by saved, I mean people are repenting from their sins and making Jesus the Lord of their lives. That they are depending solely on Jesus and his salvation, not being a good person, not doing certain works, but believing in Jesus for their salvation. Now, salvation being a sign of revival might seem obvious, but it's not easy. As we're talking about signs, much like this sign right here that you guys all see, this is called a speed limit sign. And I don't think anybody, as you've went past that at about 85, wondered what it meant, right? I, I drive a 2007 Tundra, and she does not like to go over about 75, okay? If I do, she lets me know, he's he gonna like it, right? But if I try to go to our Bristol campus, or if I'm going down Peladega Speedway, right? If I wanna go 75, I might as well get in the shoulder, right? You guys are telling me that I'm number one going 75 down that road. Now, speed limit signs are, they're, they're obvious, but are they easy to follow? No, right? And so just like when we look at revivals, people being saved is an obvious sign, but it's not easy. So let's just take a quick look at the stat sheet from just a few, I'm telling you, just a few revivals throughout history. There was a revival in Wales, the Welsh revival, where 100,000 people were saved in about a year. In America, the first great awakening, 50,000 people were saved. It really started to shape. The first and second great awakenings were paramount in, in the United States becoming what it was. The Methodist, Methodist movement, where 125,000 people were saved. And last week, I just, I couldn't encourage you more. Last week, the businessmen's revival or what became known as the lay persons, the lay prayer revival, saw a million people saved in just a little over two years, All right? And you give God some praise, it's amazing what God's people can do if we'll be sold out. Now, remember the vision that we're a part of at Faith Promise, we exist to win the world 
by equipping Christ followers, you and me, to win our world, starting with 1% of Tennessee. Now that 1% right now, that 70,000 people, and I just got to be honest with you, whenever I get into God's word and throughout this series and in prayer, that 70,000 number is getting smaller and smaller when I see how God has used his people in the past. When we're sold out, I'm telling you that 70,000 number, we are going to blow past that. And listen, those, that stat sheet of, of those salvations, that's a tiny sampling of the salvations that have been seen throughout revival. And listen, if God is lighting a passion in your heart and your life about church history and revival, I want to encourage you, jump in, study it, read about it. It will change your life. It really has changed my life. And listen, remember, this is not just for the modern church, like we saw in the Great Awakening or in Wales or anything like that. The history recorded in the Bible, and that's what is recorded in the Bible, is history. This is not a fairy tale. This is history. Salvation is a key sign of revival in the hearts of people and in the hearts of the church. In the first revival that we see break out, once Jesus uh, dies on the cross for our sin, raises from the dead and goes to heaven, as the church begins in the book of Acts, we see revival break out. And in Acts 2, and we've read this a little bit during the series, but let me remind us. In Acts 2, verses 42 through 47, it says this. And they devoted themselves, that's the, that's the church, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer, right? So they were together. Everyone was filled with awe at the many signs and wonders performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and they ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all people. But this is the sentence for this week. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. We see in the first revival that the church experienced that people were being saved, but better than that, they were being saved every day of the week. They weren't waiting for a church service for Peter or Paul or somebody to speak. People were being saved daily. They came together for services, but they came together for baptism, to see people baptized, to worship, to get into God's word and be sent out to go and win the world, to go out and win more for more people to be saved every day. And you may wonder, hey, is this an isolated incident just for the church as it got started? No, the reason that they are leading this way and loving this way and living this way is because this is how Jesus very clearly teaches Christians to act. Before he goes to heaven, when he was here on earth, he gave very clear instructions to believers. We see one of the clearest examples in Matthew chapter five, one of Jesus's famous sermons, the Sermon on the Mount, and in Matthew 5, 13 through 16, Jesus teaches believers that we are to be salt and light of the world. Now, for time purposes today, I won't talk about the salt part, but I would love to major on the light part. So let me read you what Jesus said, and then let's talk about it. In Matthew 5, verses 14 through 16, this is what Jesus said. You are the light of the world. It didn't say you if you're an extrovert. It didn't say you if you like people. It didn't say you if, if, you know, if you're not too busy. It said you are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. Jesus is very clear. Can I, can I just be like really practical for you if, if, if you're a parent in the room or anything like that? I, I, I do, I get to privilege of bedtime. Maybe you heard me talk about that. And I sing songs to, each one of my kids has, has different songs we sing, but one of them that they all get is this little light of mine. This little light of mine, 
I'm gonna let it shine. You guys know it. And it started with Valor, my, my youngest. He's more, he's more physical than the other ones. So when we were doing bedtime, I'd make sure I'd hold him tight. And we're really doing like wrestling before he goes to bed. But I'd hold him and, I, and I'd sing that song, this little light of mine. And it gets to the, the uh, I won't let, I won't let devil, it out. And I blow right in his face. And now we're both waiting. I'll say, I won't let devil, oh. And we both hold our breath. It out. And some of you guys are germ people. It's disgusting. So we're blowing each other's faces. And then we get to the, put it under a bush. Oh no. And right, I put my hand on his face. He's trying to find my face, right? He wants me to put the pillow over his head. But sometimes I think about it. And so, so we're just, we're, we're doing it. And so I do the same thing with River. I do it with JL. And then afterwards, now they're laughing. They're having a good time. And then after I say, hey, what's your light? My light's Jesus, dad. Do people need your light? Yes, sir, they need my light, dad. And so, listen, whenever I leave their room, are they like praying in tongues and like staying up night and they're like, dad, I'm fasting today because we sang that song. No, that's not what happens. But they, every day, it's my desire that they make a connection with the light in them and that people need it. We won't let the devil it out. We won't put it under a bush. Oh no, I'm gonna let it shine. And so that's part of what we have to do, part of what we have. Amen. We can do that, church. I was going to have them come up and sing, but they're, they're, it's a rowdy ruckus, so I, I, we, we didn't do that. But I want us to consider, as we keep on going, as, 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 we, as we think about this, what does the light in our life look like? Christians, our light of Jesus in our lives, is it shining for others to see, is it, listen, now, now this, may, this is very countercultural. Is it the most important thing about us? Why not? Listen, is it what we want other people to know most about us? Is it what we want to tell people the most from our life? If not, just, this isn't a moment for guilt, but why? Listen, church, this is huge. Too many of us subconsciously or consciously have put a bowl over our light, the bowl of success, the bowl of fitting in, the bowl of being too busy. But listen, if you put your light, the light of the gospel, the light of Jesus' love for you under a bowl of any sort, that is a sign to the world as well. You know what I'm saying? That's a sign too. It's just the wrong one. That is the wrong way sign. And guess what happens when you put a light under a bowl? It doesn't belong there. It doesn't survive there. Jesus, Jesus isn't dumb. When Jesus says you don't put your light under a bowl, he knows what happens whenever you put the fire of the gospel under a bowl. And I just want, I want us to think about, have we let any bowl of the world smother our light out? Have we put something over it? Have we hidden the light of Jesus in our lives? Listen, if we have, isn't it any wonder that we would feel powerless? Is it any wonder that the church in America is dying? Is it any wonder that Gen Z and coming up Gen Alpha don't see power in the church? Because listen, the data shows they're not less spiritual, but they're walking away from the church because they don't see power. Because we're not living how Jesus asked us to. Now listen, this is not a moment for judgment. I'm not judging your heart. That's, the Bible says not to do that. I would not do that. This is also not a moment for guilt, but it very well could be a moment for conviction. Because listen, I wanna encourage us to take a moment and look at Jesus's warning to the church. If the church loses sight of what matters most, I want us to look at what Jesus says to them. In Revelation 2, 4 and 5, this is what Jesus says. Yet I hold this against you. You have forsaken the love you had at first. When you think back, it's when you realize that Jesus saves you. What does your, your love look like now compared to then? Consider how far you've fallen. Repent and do the things you did at first. I think a lot of us, if we're honest, we would say that we told more people about Jesus and his love for us when we first got saved than we ever have since. 
And Jesus doesn't just say return to it. Jesus gives us a warning. If you do not repent, I will come and remove your lampstand from its place. Now, I do not believe that Jesus is saying, if you don't act right, he's gonna take your salvation. But the lampstand does reference his presence, his favor. And listen, I don't wanna do anything to jeopardize God's manifest presence, God's favor in my life. I wanna walk with him intimately. So today is a day to ask ourselves, are we going the wrong way when it comes to sharing our faith? Have you ever noticed, have you ever noticed what's on the back side of road signs? That there's obviously directional signs on the first one, but have you ever taken a minute to look at the back side of a road sign? There's nothing on there. There's nothing on the back side of a road sign. Why is that? You shouldn't be looking at it. You shouldn't be seeing it. Our lives, if you're seeing it, something's wrong. Or your parents got a car with your seat facing backwards on purpose, okay? But that's, you have to see a counselor about that, right? Our lives, our lives are supposed to be signs of revival in unity, in prayer, in sharing our faith. But if we, church, have chosen to go the wrong way, if we have chosen to abandon the route of heaven and live for the world, and we are going the wrong way, the world will see no sign of revival in our life. People should not be able to be around you for long without realizing, I'm going the wrong way. My marriage doesn't look like that. My kids don't look like that. My joy doesn't look like that. My generosity doesn't look like that. My words of affirmation don't look like that. My energy doesn't look like that. But do people see that? Are we looking at the wrong side? Because instead of telling people they're going the wrong way, we're going the wrong way. We, Isaiah says that we are signs and symbols of God's kingdom. Our lives are to be signs of revival, right? People need the hope that Jesus gave us. So let's ask, why don't we share our faith? Why don't we tell people about Jesus? Well, this is a passion for our church and we wanna equip uh, ourselves and our, our, our friends and our family, our kids to win their world. And so I asked a question about a year ago, uh, what word comes to mind when you think about sharing your faith? And in that service, about 1,700 students and adults responded. And the number one word that came to mind when you thought about sharing your faith was fear. We put together a word cloud of all the things that come to mind, but the number one thing that came to mind was fear. Fear, now there were some positive things, but fear was the main thing that came to mind. Now listen, I just want to see how crazy this is. Watch this revelation that God is so good to us. Because our staff, we know that, that sharing our faith is challenging. We wanna lead the way. So we've been doing training and development on becoming more efficient at sharing our faith so that we can lead the way. And we're actually reading a book together right now called Before You Share Your Faith. And it's, a, it's, it's so good. So we actually put a QR code so you can go and buy that uh, as God is encouraging you to share your faith. This is a great thing for you to read as a family. It's a little book, you can do it. But just imagine like the chance of this. This week we're on chapter three as a staff and it is about loving the lost, about loving the lost. And in this chapter, the, the author says that he used to be convinced that fear was the primary reason that people did not share their faith. And then he said this, until it hit me, what was holding me back was not the presence of fear, but the absence of love. What a challenge, church, man of God, woman of God. Listen, if you love something, you would look silly, aren't you? If you love something, you you would look like a fool. It doesn't matter. You're willing to be wrong. You're willing to take a risk. You're willing to jump out there. Think about your love for a friend or your, your spouse or your kids, whatever it might be. Listen, have we lost our love for people, specifically and especially people who don't know Jesus? 
In the Bible, and listen, listen, again, this is not for guilt. This is something so specific that the devil wants to rob from your life and from the life of the church because he knows eternity rests in this discipline. There's a guy in the Bible, maybe you've heard of, his name is Jonah. And you may have known, he's the guy that got swallowed by the whale or the fish in the Old Testament. But maybe you don't know why he was swallowed. He was swallowed because God said, hey, go and share your faith. Go and tell people about my grace. Go and tell the Ninevites, the Assyrians. And Jonah said, nope, not doing it. They don't vote like me. They don't look like me. They don't talk like me. When I think about them, when I see their colors, it makes me mad. I get, I get offended. I get frustrated. I'm not going, God. Ain't no way. I'm gonna get in a boat. I'm gonna go the opposite way. And whenever that boat starts, I'll jump off. I'm not going. What about us? Do we feel like our life might be going the wrong way? Do you feel like there's not light in your life? Do you feel like maybe you lack power or passion or purpose? God is willing, listen, God is willing to take everything from our lives until we stop going the wrong way. And listen, I think it's good. But parents, are you not willing to take everything from your kid until their attitude or their grades are going the right way? Yeah, you are. And our good, good father is willing to discipline those whom he loves until we are going the right way. Faith promise, we cannot lose our lampstand. We cannot lose God's favor. We cannot lose God's presence in and on our life. Listen, it is huge. It's paramount. Listen, but why would he give us his lampstand? Why would he give us his light and his presence if we don't care about what he cares about? And the number one thing he cares about is his kids that are far from him, his kids that are lost. Wouldn't that be what you cared about if your kids were lost? If I called you and said, JL, I can't find JL. I went to pick her up from school. And they said, somebody else picked her up and I can't find her. Would you say, hey, I'm in a meeting. I'll come help you as soon as I'm done. Hey, I, me and my, we watch this show at night. Let me, let me hit you up tomorrow. No. You know where, where you at? Where have you looked? I'll look somewhere else. Where do I go? What do I do? You would hit that desperation just where I was. We have to decide that we're not gonna go the wrong way so that people's eternity isn't spent away from God. So what are we gonna do? I wrestled a lot with this. I, I, was, I was thinking, do we do a practical teaching? Like where you write your story out and we share it in the room? Or like, what, what do we do to help you share your faith? Do we think about two or three practical ways? But I really believe that the breakthrough that we need is a spiritual one. I believe that if we could find or maybe ignite for the first time our love for the lost, that that fire and that passion would shed light on what is next for you to win people to Jesus. And so we're gonna press in right now for a spiritual breakthrough. Listen, we're gonna be posting on social media practical ways and things you could do to share your faith. But while we're here, right here together, we're gonna to press in for transformation. We're gonna press in that God would change our hearts, that God would give us a supernatural focus. We are going to press in for transformation. That's what we need. That's what we need God to give us. And let me tell you the plan. Next weekend will be a, a baptism weekend. We're gonna, we're gonna present the gospel and give people an opportunity to be saved. I'm believing for 200 baptisms. Can we believe for 200 baptisms? That's nothing, that's nothing. We can see it, I'm telling you. But here's what's gonna be special about it. Here's what's gonna be special. We are believing that more people will get baptized next week, that you lead to Jesus Monday through Saturday than the people who get saved on Sunday. I repeat, we are believing and praying that more people get baptized next Sunday, that you lead to Jesus Monday through Saturday. You lead him to Jesus and let's come, let's celebrate it together. 
And listen, maybe the best you could do is get him to service. That's fine, but let's stretch, let's push, let's be the light that our world so desperately needs, a sign of revival. Hey students, I feel really led that you are supposed to lead the way. You're still just crazy enough to believe that this Bible might be true, that God might use you, and you're going into, I would say, the most concentrated place where people are around you. What if, church, what if we saw 100 students baptized next weekend? Would that not just blow it up? Students, we believe in you. Middle school, high school, college, we believe in you. Lead the way. We will happily follow you into revival. So right now, we're gonna take our win your world steps together, and we're gonna take uh, some time, and we are gonna pray for what we call Bob. Now, if your name's Bob, not you specifically, but we're gonna pray for Bob, a burden to love the lost, an opportunity to share Jesus with them, and boldness to be obedient, a burden to love the lost. Hey. Do you love the lost? Do you care? Not just that they'll die and go to hell, but they don't have God in their life. Do you care? If you don't care, listen, that's not between me and you. That's between you and God. Could you talk to him here in a minute about why? Could you ask him to give you a burden for the lost? The same one that he has, a burden to love the lost, a opportunity to share your faith and a a boldness to step forward